Welcome to my channel. My name is Josh, and today I'm talking about China. I love China. Let me clarify that when I say China in this video, I am not including Hong Kong and Taiwan, but only referring solely to the mainland, also known as the People's Republic of China. As Taiwan and Hong Kong are disputed socially as truly being a part of China, I will completely disregard them from this argument. Even if I were to include Taiwan and Hong Kong as part of China, then the case for it becoming the world's most dominant technological superpower would be even easier to showcase. Between the years of 2000 and 2018, the GDP per capita of the USA doubled. In that same time frame, China's multiplied 10 times over. Their rate and increase of financial power, influence, and personal wealth is far surpassing that of the United States, even before COVID brought the world to its knees economically. Elon Musk predicted that the Chinese economy will surpass the US by at least twofold, possibly threefold. And the thing is, that's not exactly surprising. The current GDP per capita of the United States is about $60,000 USD per capita and around 10,000 USD per person for China. However, only 10 years ago, it was less than half of that for China at about $4,500 per person. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to follow that graph's exponential and realize that even at a fraction of their current pace, the United States will be overtaken incredibly soon. Many experts estimate by as soon as 2027. China has around 1.4 billion people, so naturally their overall GDP surpassing ours isn't that surprising. But what a lot of people don't think about is the dilution of wealth. If everybody in the world had a million dollars, a million dollars would no longer be worth anything because money doesn't carry value on its own. The very nature of wealth is in the parity itself between the haves and have-nots. Something is only worth significant value if it's difficult to obtain and other people don't have access to it. The exclusivity of cash is what makes it valuable. When you dilute cash flow, you inflate the currency, meaning it loses value in more ways than one. The real issue here is not whether or not China can compete with the US in terms of military or fiscal power, but whether they can maintain realistic growth of wealth on a per capita basis without damaging the value of their currency. In order for every person in China to become wealthy, or at least maintain a first world quality of life, that would mean that 20% of the entire world population would have to be capable of reaching such status. And that's a tall order, even in a world that's increasingly wealthy and stable. With all of that said, I do think China is capable of becoming the richest nation on earth with enough given time. They have the geographical resources, the knowledge, the unity, and the willpower as a nation to climb to the top and then extend it. But where would that leave the rest of the world? Because China is so large as a population, its wealth balances itself out like a teeter-totter. The wealthier China becomes, the poorer the rest of the world will become. Now that doesn't mean the quality of life will inherently decrease for people in other places as China's increases, but their purchasing power absolutely will. As I explained earlier, everybody can't be rich, or else everything in the world would just continue to become more and more expensive until that equilibrium is met again. So who will suffer as China climbs the economical ladder? The key to this question will be where technology develops the most and the fastest. Whenever a country embraces technological advancements, they have about a 20-year explosion of wealth, but that cannot and does not continue forever. When you introduce a technologically driven economy into your nation, it amasses wealth because suddenly you have an incredible growth of tech sector STEM field related jobs. Jobs that typically pay a lot more and bring in more money towards your country's GDP. However, this can only happen to a certain degree until you hit a plateau and some countries are actually already hitting that peak. That peak could come because you no longer have citizens going into STEM fields and have already maxed out the percentage of your population that's physically capable or young enough to go into tech jobs, as is happening in Japan. Or it could happen for reasons such as running out of geographical space, like is happening currently in Hong Kong. Not every person in your country can be a programmer. Essential services are still needed. Every country still needs cooks, people producing iron, and driving buses. As Japan's population hit a massive plateau in the 1980s, their economy likewise hasn't grown much since. Japan developed so much and so quickly through the 70s, 80s, and 90s that there was nowhere left to go except down, or to stall, which is exactly what happened. 
they had already filled the maximum role technologically that the world could harbor at that time. And at that point, the world's wealth couldn't overextend itself to buy electronics beyond what it needed. Whether Japan's population decrease was an effect or causation of their great economic stall is debatable, but one thing is for sure, they peaked far too early and they couldn't maintain the growth in a world that just hadn't caught up yet. And I hope to see a strong economic comeback from the land of the rising sun one day in the future. Where Japan left off, the United States took off. From the 1980s to the mid-2000s, America saw unprecedented growth in its tech sector. San Francisco and San Jose's Silicon Valley, Seattle, Los Angeles, and more recently New York City became the world's dominant forces driving all technological development. But that is stalling now, and not for the same reason it happened to Japan. Japan was ahead of their time. The world's resources became their bottleneck. But for America, it's happening because of competition, mostly from China. Not only are the vast majority of electronic devices made by American and Japanese companies now made in China, but the Chinese are now building their own brands to compete with ours. In the mid-2000s, with the release of the Apple iPhone original, Apple was making half of every phone manufactured in the entire world. They literally cornered the entire market. There was no competitor who could hold a candle to the technological research and prowess of the Silicon Valley tech machine. And you didn't need to look any further than the product. The iPhone was so ahead of its time that it's astounding looking back at its competition. It was in an entire league of its own. But today, when we look at innovation in smartphones, it's actually almost entirely dominated by Chinese phones, with a few South Korean exceptions. When was the last time Apple or any American tech giant came out with a phone that had any new features whatsoever that aren't already several years behind the international curve? Companies like OnePlus, Huawei, Oppo, Xiaomi, and Samsung are clearly leading the smartphone sector. That isn't to say Americans aren't making any good products anymore, they're just not making as innovative ones. And the wealth of a country follows its innovation. You get results in direct proportion to your efforts. The United States is flirting with an economic recession. While the Fed pumps fake printed cash into the US stock market to keep it artificially inflated, our company's production output is coming to a grinding halt due to self-imposed regulatory actions. And America isn't looking to just plateau like Japan did. Our house of cards is dangerously close to an economic freefall, and somebody has to swoop in to pick up the slack when America's economy collapses. Just as they did in 2008, China is waiting in the background, building up and silently biding their time while producing a stable but exponentially increasing economy year over year. On a hardware front, the US is still significantly ahead when it comes to GPU, CPU, and mobile chip advancements. Apple, Nvidia, and AMD are all currently leading the charge. But this isn't so much innovation as it is evolution. The way the chips operate is mostly the same from year to year, and the percentage of power increase is less and less yearly to the point now where a new processor generation is likely no better performing than the previous gen, probably just has better thermals or a smaller footprint per teraflop of power. Moore's law was already exhausted by the 1990s, and by 2010, performance over yearly percentages was so low that it almost didn't even matter anymore. Long gone are the days of doubling the amount of transistors in a fixed space over the previous year. All of this is to say that despite Silicon Valley's current monopoly on the market of physical processing chips, as their power gains continue to slow, other countries will be able to catch up more quickly, pulling the technological foundation out from California and leaving it economically awash. Just as China did with manufacturing, you can expect, no, even bet, Shenzhen is already catching up and becoming the world's next Silicon Valley under our nose. They'll be making the same chips as the Americans, but now even cheaper and better. On a side note, most Intel, AMD, Nvidia, and Apple chips are already manufactured in China, Taiwan, or Malaysia anyways. So now it's just a matter of waiting until Chinese brands can compete with American intellectual property, and then they'll already be set up for the manufacturing to compete. China is arguably still behind the United States when it comes to software development in general. However, in the past five years or so, the Chinese government and controlled corporations of the Republic have poured money into researching AI and likely will lead the world in the fourth industrial revolution of software advancements. AI is the next frontier, a new wild west, 
and China is placing themselves into a position to develop it beyond the capabilities currently known, with a very limited or regulation-free environment. Though this should be some reason for concern, as AI is still uncharted territory, there is no denying that the future of software is artificial labor. One of, if not the single biggest obstacles suppressing innovation in America is red tape. The American way of life over the past hundred years has transitioned from free economic expression into a bureaucratic paper mill for small businesses and startups. Big corporations like Walmart and Amazon love the red tape because it helps them prevent small businesses from competing. When you make several billion dollars in yearly revenue, it's easy to hire a horde of lawyers to navigate through complicated patent filings, abstract laws, and find loopholes and regulations to benefit your company. Not to mention the ease of access to offshore accounts and pass-through entities. The new America is designed to complement the rich or mega corporations that have already succeeded, but punish the garage band type companies just trying to get started. Equal opportunity is not a word you'd use to describe the current state of the American business model. The USA has some of the highest corporate and capital taxes in the world, and yet its biggest companies don't pay it. But be assured, if you or I started a business in America, the IRS would be at your front door collecting or arresting. There is a reason China is attracting startups from all around the world, even from America. They have a much simpler tax system, significantly less red tape, and less burden on startups to file for pending patents. In 2018, the Chinese filed three times as many patents as companies in the United States, and their percentage of approval was greater, not to mention the fact that the majority of their patents were from startups. But in the United States, over 90% of all patents filed were by megacorporations. Apple alone filed over 2,000 US patents in that year. When I filed my first patent here in the US, it took two years for the patent office to respond, only for them to reject my claim because my invention was, in their own words, too specific and too detailed. They asked me to resubmit with a more vague, all-encompassing concept, as if patent lawsuits weren't arbitrary enough as is. I was sent nearly 200 pages of documentation of things I needed to update or change in order to refile, all from an initial three-page patent claim. From minor details such as a thin border going around the page to simple page numbers on the bottom left of the documents, everything had to be completely redone to satisfy the US Patent Office. And after resubmission and another $1,000 fee, I would be looking at another year of wait time. It's no surprise startups are looking east for new ventures. In all aspects of Chinese society, history, and law, you can see the one China policy and slogan. The strong nationalism and unity felt by all Chinese is the glue that binds the nation together, drives their actions, and propels the country forward. New key initiatives are reinforced with the goal to make China a stronger and more prosperous nation. In recent years, Xi Jinping's favorite slogan has become Chinese dream, an idea that if you work hard for your nation, you will achieve happiness. As long as the people have faith, the nation has hope, and the state has strength, these values will stay deeply ingrained in every citizen from birth. The strong loyalty to China as a country is so pervasive that it encourages a strong sense of unity and pride in their country from within. Only one party has complete rule over China, the Han Party, so you don't witness political divisions on the same scale as we are currently experiencing in the West. This unity allows nothing to stand in the way of development as the country moves ahead in all areas of growth. For better or worse, China is a nation of order. Make no mistake, China, like most places in the world, is absolutely not perfect, and they have a complicated history when it comes to human rights and personal freedoms. By no means are they a shining emblem of social utopia. But despite all of its natural flaws, the Chinese government is encouraging growth and innovation on a scale the West hasn't seen in 50 years. No one knows the future definitively. World events and world wars can massively throw off the current expectations for the scales of growth. But assuming the future is more of the same, China is looking to become the richest, most powerful, influential, and technologically dominant country well within this generation. Thanks for watching this video. These videos take a lot of research and time to make, so I hope you'll like and subscribe down below. And don't forget to hit the bell notification button for more videos coming soon.